Uh, she's going to be just a few minutes late, but we're just going to get going, and then uh, she'll she'll jump in. So I think we're just going to get started by having everybody here go down the line and give a quick are what they do. Sure. Thanks, Lee, and thanks everyone for coming despite the torrential downpour this morning. Looks like the, the skies have parted and everyone made it here in one piece. Um, well, except for Gigi. It remains to be seen. She's on her way. So I'm Sarah Morris. Uh, I, am, I direct our open internet policy at New America's Open Technology Institute. Um, New, New America is a big think tank with m uh, multiple programs. Many of you may be familiar with the work we do in other, on other issues like education policy, work family balance, um, and, and international shop. And uh, we are a multidisciplinary uh, program with technologists, advocates, researchers, and practitioners. Um, and we, as an organization, have been heavily involved in net neutrality uh, for, for since, since our pro, since we for our entire existence. Um, and most recently in the debates, uh, our focus has been um, on, on, of course, getting strong rules grounded in sound legal authority, but also in ensuring that those rules um, are applied to both fixed broadband and wireless broadband. We also did um, a significant amount of research on issues related to interconnection disputes and the harms that they have on consumers um, across the country. And so we are here, I'm here today, uh, to, to talk about the value of those rules, the impact they've had on um, a variety of internet sectors and consumers, and to urge, uh, urge everyone to maintain the rules uh, in the face of this new proposal from the FCC. I'm uh, Matt Murchison, I'm a partner at Latham and Watkins in the communications group of our firm. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to again say thank you for, uh, for, for having me and for all of the panelists uh, today. Uh, I think you know, we've kind of come here at, at uh, sort of an oddly perfect moment where uh, all three branches of government are all weighing in on this issue at the same time, in the same week, um, where we had uh, the, uh, the, you know, the court's ruling on the rehearing petitions earlier this week. We've got ongoing FCC activity, obviously. We've got um, uh, ongoing legislative activity, too, a new bill introduced this week. Um, so it's, it's a sort of everything's going on at once, perfect timing for, uh, for a panel to, to, to talk about these things. Um, a bit about how I'm connected to the debate. Um, I am uh, and my firm represent uh, NCTA. Uh, which is the trade association that represents um, largely cable ISPs. Um, NCTA also has uh, video programmers and, uh, and content providers as its members. Um, we, uh, um, I think our, our interest in the debate is pretty obvious. <laughs> um, uh, NCTA, obviously, its, its, its cable ISP members are the entities that are um, you know, singled out for, for regulation in the open internet rules and uh, were the ones that, um, uh, along with other ISPs, are, um, are, uh, were made subject to Title II uh, under the 2015 order. Um, and I have uh, represented them both at the FCC and in the, uh, in the DC Circuit Appeal. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gigi Sohn, and I apologize for being late. Um, I have been a Democratic affordable networks for longer than I'm willing to admit. Uh, but uh, it's been my life's work. I would, uh, if folks want to know more about me, I actually have a website, ggsone.com. I now have three fellowships uh, after serving uh, Tom Wheeler as his counselor for three years and uh, helping to provide some input open internet order. So my three fellowships are with the Open Society Foundations, Mozilla, uh, and will be announced next week with uh, Georgetown University Law School's Institute for Technology, Policy, and Law. So that's how in the progressive foundation world you make a living, is you get money from a lot of different places. So my position is, is very clear, 2015 order, but I think it's important what the debate is really about. And Sarah alluded to this, and I missed part of Sarah's um, conversation, so I apologize. Most people should not block, should not throttle, should not engage in paid prioritization. There's some nibbling around the edges on that third one, but for the most part, there's agreement. 
And I don't actually think that net neutrality is what this debate is about. This debate is about whether the agency, which is tasked by law since 1934 and even before that, 1927, with overseeing communications networks, will have absolutely no role in overseeing the most important network of our lifetime. And what does that mean? Well, that means there will be fight by the FCC, if Chairman Pai gets his way, on things like competition, fraudulent billing, privacy. And it does amuse me after um, Congress repealed this to hear uh, support. Section 222 is still on the board. Yeah, well, not if you give away your authority to the FTC. It's one thing to have authority, to have power, and not use it. It's another thing to completely abdicate that authority to another agency. And while I love the FTC, and when I was at the FCC, we worked very closely with them. I love Terrell McSweeney. I've been friends with Maureen O'Hazen for years. They're great people. They're not the expert agency. They do not know how networks are managed. Okay, and that's where it's really, really important for the FCC to have a role. If we want to have a debate of what kind of authority the FCC should have, let's have that debate. But the notion that this agency, the expert agency overseeing network, should have no role in overseeing broadband she becomes incredible. is a complete and total non-starter. So I guess my advice is keep your eye on the ball. This is really about the future of the FCC, not so much about net neutrality. I'm Baron Soka. I run Tech Freedom. We are a small uh, nonprofit, much smaller than the ones that uh, Gigi has been involved in, and we've we've uh, free speech, and uh, and we've been at at, uh, at at loggerheads on other issues. Although, as I'll say in a moment, I think we actually agree on a lot more than you might imagine, even in that area. Uh, but just briefly, uh, we cover a wide range of topics, as I just said. Uh, we, in this case, have been involved since uh, since the before that. Uh, back in 2002, I was a young student in Tim Wu's internet law class when he was debating what became the concept of net neutrality with Glenn Robinson, who was a uh, commissioner on the FCC back in the 1970s. The two of them co-taught that class. Little did I imagine that I would then spend uh, 15 years later, I'd still be debating this uh, one panel after another, and that we would be in the, by my count, so this is the third rulemaking at the FCC, but if you will, it's either the fourth or fifth time that we've been through this debate, if you count the Comcast BitTorrent debate back in 2007, and then in two issuance of the Open Internet Policy Statement. So before I summarize my views as Gigi did, I'm just curious to get a show of hands from people in the room. How many of you are excited to be fighting about this again for the third to fifth time? Anyone? No. Mike, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, is anybody here in the room of the view that we would not be better off with a clear resolution of this issue? No one. So, so thus far, I totally agree with Gigi. Does anyone here in the room think that it's not the job of Congress to resolve major policy questions through legislation? Right. So we all have all of those things. <laughs> so, so, so then I'll respond to Gigi. So, uh, the intervener uh, arguing against the FCC, just as I, are the interveners on the other side. So there are civil society groups on both sides. We represent a small company that and a series of, uh, of, of entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley who have been involved in VoIP services for who back in the early uh, aughts uh, spent four years trying to get the FCC to issue the Pulver Order in 2004 that drew a clear bright line between uh, the internet, VoIP services, and Title II, which was part of that mix of things that the FCC did leading up to 2005. And we, uh, I'm happy to say, have led the losing side twice in litigation, which is to say that in the most recent uh, denial of rehearing, we got two judges on the DC Circuit to agree with us um, wholeheartedly that this is simply not the kind of question that is appropriate for the agency on. That it is a major question, as Justice Breyer 
uh, started to argue when he was a law professor back in the 1970s. Sort of Congress. And so we intend to take this, court, this case up to the Supreme Court. We can talk about the odds of getting cert and so on, but I believe truly that, uh, number one, this is uh, not a question for the FCC to resolve, and that this is a question that Congress should resolve. So in that respect, I agree wholeheartedly with Gigi's characterization of this debate, that this is, in fact, almost entirely not a policy debate. We can talk about some things on the margins but it is really a debate about the FCC's authority. Where I disagree with her is that her argument essentially is, this is really important, therefore the FCC must have legal authority. And my argument is that uh, we simply, we, we decide policy questions after legal questions. And my view, Ajit's view, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly's view, Rob McDowell's view before him, has always been that the FCC simply does not have legal authority here and that if there is to be a, a, the implementation of a policy consensus on net neutrality, that is a job for Congress to do. And that before that happens, the day that the FCC issues the order in this proceeding, that these issues will revert to the status quo ante 2010, which means the Federal Trade Commission will be the lead federal agency it will enforce competition laws and consumer protection laws, as well as holding companies to whatever promises they make. The Department of Justice will enforce the antitrust laws, along with the FTC. And in case you don't tr trust the Trump administration, keep in mind that all those state attorneys general, including those Democrats who are very active to go out and, and, and bring big cases, that they too will have broad powers to enforce the existing antitrust and consumer protection laws and so will private plaintiffs. In other words, there is a layered approach that is, in my opinion, could always have addressed these problems. And I will just close by saying that, to me, the moment when this debate went off the rails was in 2008, when the Federal Trade Commission stood ready to bring an enforcement action against Comcast. The leading Democrat, John Leibowitz, and the Republican, Debbie Majoris, were ready to bring that case. And the Republican chairman at the, the FCC at the time insisted that he was going to decide this case because the FCC had to have a role, and in a sense he agreed with Gigi. And that was the debate at which this, uh, the moment at which this debate went off the rails because we didn't have the FTC explore its authority. We could have had a constructive conversation about what more to do with that, and I would be open to legislation that would enshrine in law clear bright line rules. I would prefer for them to be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, but we could have that debate. But unfortunately, we have then proceeded since then on the assumption that the FCC has to decide this, and the FCC must have legal authority no matter what by any means necessary. And that, in turn, has brought us to a complete reversal from the late 1990s, where Democrats were saying things like, let's not dump the whole morass of Title II on the cable pipe. So we got a lot to cover today. <laughs> um, really appreciate you guys kind of laying out some of the different positions on this. I think there is a broad discussion to be had, and I'm going to start a little bit narrower with just what's immediately ahead of us um, in terms of what's going on at the FCC with Title and the by Chairman Pai to undo those rules. Would love to hear what you guys think about how that process is going to play out, and if you. Think the FCC can successfully back Title II. I would just start by saying, um, and, and, and a little bit responding to, to uh, the, some of the things that Barron included in his introduction, to the extent that we're all tired of having the same debate about net neutrality, we can stop, <laughs> right? The, the, rules, the, the rules are the law of the land. The D.C. Circuit decisions to not grant rehearing um, either on banc or by panel this week, means that those rules are still enshrined as law. Um, the only thing keeping them in controversy at this moment in time is the proposal um, from, from Chairman Pai to completely integrate those rules and authority. So there, there isn't a question at this point in time, except for maybe a narrow, a very narrow question of uh, Supreme Court cert and review which we can talk about separately. But as far as um, the rules go and the FCC's authority um, to implement those rules, that has all been decided. But, but I have to say to Sarah, I feel like we're in one of those like, broken relationships where I'm going to the therapist and I'm saying you know, that she doesn't listen to me because, <laughs> because the, the debate here is about legal authority. And, 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 and the other side just, just doesn't, they don't acknowledge that there have been longstanding 
valid arguments from, from us and from the commissioners rejecting the underlying premise that the agency has authority. And if you take that premise away, then, then the rules themselves are, are just, they're just not something the agency can do. So I would just object to the characterization of the question. This proceeding is not about the rules. It's about legal authority, and we all know how it's going to end. Ajit and Mike have never been inconsistent about this, and, and this is going to be handed back to the Federal Trade Commission and other agencies. And then the question is, what, does, what do they do, and is there legislation? So I think the authority question is very well settled by the Supreme Court in a case called Brand X which is one of the reasons why the Supreme Court won't grant cert. The second reason is actually Pai has given us, the chairman has actually given us a gift uh, by as much as I would love to, you know, just put the NPRM in the shredder, that's the notice of proposed rulemaking, he's, they're going to vote on May 18th. He's given us a gift in the Supreme Court because why would the Supreme Court take a, take a case when these rules are likely to be reversed? And he has the votes, okay? So you've got the Brand X case, you've got the Verizon versus FCC case. So the DC Circuit, the Supreme Court has ruled the FCC has the authority and has the discretion to classify broadband internet access as either a telecommunications service like Tom Wheeler did or as an information service as Michael Powell did and as Ajit Pai proposes to do. So, so that question actually really has been settled. Now what's gonna happen? There's gonna be a proceeding that's gonna start on May 18th I predict it will go, I think the chairman would like it to end in October. I think that's highly unlikely. I do credit him with not going straight to uh, a ruling called a declaratory ruling. He could overturn Title II tomorrow, okay? I give him praise for it. would make it, Mike, you're shaking your head. It would make it very vulnerable in court. I almost kind of wish he did because it would be very, very vulnerable in court. I think he's being wise, both as a transparency matter, as a, as, you know, as a, matter of public import matter to do this in a notice of proposed rulemaking. He wants to get it done in October. I think November, December is more likely. And yes, he has the votes to do it. In those seven to eight months, I promise you, the wrath of the American people are, are gonna be, are gonna come down upon him. And not just you know ordinary Americans, but the late night comics and the commentators and the tech press. There will be more support from the other side, I can guarantee you, I think. I think the anti-net neutrality forces have learned their lesson. But I still think the overwhelming majority of people, and they've been prepped by the privacy debate. I know you guys, a lot of you guys know how painful that was. The privacy CRA, people think and believe that the broadband internet is critically important to their lives. Privacy is critically important to their lives. They don't love their ISPs, okay? This debate is gonna be a referendum on ISPs and a referendum on the FCC and its current chairman. And it's gonna be, I really, I would love to move on and talk about getting universal broadband to everybody, but if we're gonna have this debate, it's gonna be one where the American people are gonna weigh in heavily. I would just add a, a few points. Um, first, and this is responding to Gigi, but also just kind of to the, the way the question is often framed. Um, I, I think too often, and this goes back to something that Barron was, was getting at, too often this debate <laughs> conflates two, I think, very distinct concepts and two concepts that were distinct for a long time uh, before um, 2014, 2015. Um, and those two concepts are net neutrality and Title II. Net neutrality has been something that has been kind of percolating for a long time, right? We had. Uh, Michael Powell's Four Freedom speech in 2004, that then became the internet policy statement in 2005, that then was sought to be enforced in 2007, 2008. Then we had net neutrality rules under 2000, the, th the 2010 open internet rule. Um, and, and so on and so forth, we've now got the 2015 order that we're talking about now and, and still further efforts. That's sort of one thing. Um, another thing is Title II. Title II was, something developed a long time ago, largely to, to regulate uh, legacy telephone companies. It's been updated over the course of time, but uh, still is very telephone focused. You'll, if you just read the provisions of the statute, of that portion of the statute, it's uh, quite tailored to telephone service, and actually that's why um, the FCC forbore from a lot of Title II when it um, imposed 
of the telecommunications service classification, the Title II classification, uh, uh, Title II, uh, tele telecommunications service classification on broadband providers. Um, but I think we need to kind of keep those two things separate because the fact of the matter is you can have net neutrality without Title II. Title II is a source of legal authority that has been cited in 2015. Um, again, it's a poor fit, and there are, I think, a few avenues that the FCC could pursue and that, you know, policymakers in D.C. could pursue. I mean, first of all, and I think we'll probably be, probably be getting to this, um, but, you know, in the Verizon case in, 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 uh, in 2014 um, made quite clear that the FCC has authority under Section 706 to adopt open Internet rules. Now, I know that there is, you know, some skepticism um, from some in this debate about whether that ruling was, was correct, um, but it happens to be the law of the D.C. Circuit, um, it was reaffirmed in the, in the U.S. Telecom case. Um, so Section 706 exists as, as a reservoir of authority. Uh, but even separate from Section 706, um, net neutrality is possible if we just kind of solve the legal authority question once and for all. Um, and that's done through Congress. Um, Congress hasn't really said anything about net neutrality before. <laughs> um, I think we all kind of wish it would. Um, because then it would uh, take, I think, what, I, and I agree with, with uh, you know, Gigi and Barron, you know, I think pointed out that there's largely agreement on some of these policy issues. Um, you know, maybe some disagreement at some points, and we can talk about that. But, um, you know, a, a colleague of mine said, and I think it's accurate, um, this is one of those rare instances where we have, you know, 80% of the people on one side and 80% of the people on the other side agree on about 90% of what should happen. And legislation has overcome uh, far greater hurdles than that. Um, so I think just, you know, it's, it's important to, to just keep the two concepts separate. I know that there's, you know, that we're going to hear uh, how they are, you know, necessarily intertwined uh, from others on this panel. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it's useful as we think through this debate that they don't necessarily have to be the same thing, and they, they really aren't. If Andrew Jackson were alive today. <laughs> That's great. So, so can I just, I love that. This is, this is where Baron and I, don't, go, go, go don't, don't go I get finish. to finish? Yes, I mean, go, that, go finish. Okay, okay. I just thought that was a cute Thank you. quip and you were going to stop. But. No, no. Make sure, because people get really tied up about this. So the reason I say that, this is, that, that there are not going to be no rules and that this is not a debate about rules and that the comments that will be filed in this docket about the rules are really better directed to Congress is that we already know what the two Republican commissioners think the agency's legal authority is here. They believe that, that uh, Title II will not be applied to broadband, that Brand X was, a, was about a different service and was about confirming the agency's discretion over that service to decide. Now, you may not agree with that, but that, so that's number one. Number two, they agree with me. I, I, we, our organization has been the most outspoken in explaining why Section 706 cannot be read as an independent grant of authority, that it is, in fact, a commandment to the agency to use its other tools to promote broadband deployment. If you, if you get to those two premises as a predictive matter, I assure you that the, the Republicans on the commission will. That means that Gigi, in what she said in the outset, will be correct that the agency will be saying, we do not have authority here. That, now, there's a little quibble about what the agency could do with ancillary jurisdiction. We could talk about that if you really want to. Suffice it to say that the agency, that door was opened in 2010 by the Comcast decision. The agency never really fully explored it, but they're not going to, and, and nor should they for all sorts of, of, of good reasons. So this is a debate about the agency's legal authority. It is not a debate about policy, and those, those, it, those comments are best directed to Congress, as I said. And then just a word about the litigation. Gigi's correct that the, the court is not likely to grant cert. But it is difficult to predict here what will happen and how the court will operate in the future. The administration, I think, is, is in the same situation the Reagan administration was in in 1981, where they came in wanting to change all the things that, that a re re and they quickly discovered only too late, that by mooting the cases, uh, the, the open uh, administrative issues, that they mooted the litigation that they would have wanted to change precedent. And I will just put out here now that I think that it, there's a very good chance that this uh, administration and the FCC will in fact ask the court to take this case. And the reason I say that 
and this is the most important thing I will say to you today, again, as a, just a purely predictive matter, is that under the current law of the land, which Gigi describes, Brand X and US Telecom, the Commission has the discretion to go up or down. And what that means is that when Ajit is done with this proceeding, this issue will be handed back to that layered approach that I described, and there will or will not be legislation. I want there to be, but I have to assume that there won't be. And if there is not, what will happen is we will spend the next four to eight years under the FTC-led approach with DOJs and state Democratic attorneys general and so on playing their role, and then the next Democratic FCC will come back and re-reclassify and reinterpret 706 as a grant of authority, and we will be right back where we started. So in other words, we are heading for limbo unless we get legislation or a clear Supreme Court decision. And I'm hopeful that we will get that decision, and as I said, we will be asking the court to take the case, and I would not discount the possibility that it will. I mean, they, they, they absolutely cannot if you put any, any stock into the D.C. Circuit, which has now, and it's important to remember the D.C. Circuit has ruled over and over again on net neutrality rules. The reason that we are still having the debate is not because um, of some, like, radical change in strategy throughout the debate. It's because the FCC has historically tried in good faith to implement um, strong net neutrality rules up until the 20th uh, to find the right balance of rule and legal footing, which, which they did. And they, they followed the, the roadmap put forward by the D.C. Circuit um, in, in the Verizon VFCC. They crafted rules that were grounded on, on strong Title II authority. They forbore from all of the, the portions of Title II that were inapplicable. Um, and, and what we were left with were, were very clear prohibitions against blocking, throttling, and paying. Um, behaviors that the, the record made clear were particularly problematic. Then they essentially readopted the 2010 non-discrimination rule as the, the commonly referred to general conduct rule as a way to ensure that they still had the authority to examine other practices. This is in reality a very light touch uh, but, but clear approach and it, what's important to remember, and this is why um, in response to Matt's earlier point, sorry we have to go back Took me a while to get back in the slot uh, or in the queue. But going back to Matt's earlier point about the, uh, the fact that, that Title II and net neutrality are so inextricably linked, they, 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 all, they, they can't be separated because the only way that you get strong um, net neutrality rules is through Title II. That has been made crystal clear um, by the courts. And wonderfully for us, that is, that is the current state of play, as I said earlier, of right now. We have strong rules, we have clear authority, is Chairman Pai through to start a proceeding um, to undo those rules. So let me say a couple things. Is number one, obviously I agree with Sarah on 100 percent. <clears throat> 706, and I agree with Barron, 706 is about as shaky a grant of jurisdiction. It has been upheld in the Tenth Circuit in the Universal Service case, a couple times in DC Circuit, but for clearly for strong Rules, the real rules we have now, it does not suffice. Okay, now we, before we reclassified, we tried to do Title I uh, data roaming rules, okay? And it's a list of like 15 different things, and it requires individualized negotiations, and it require, and, and it allows discrimination. That's what the DC Circuit said. You can have rules under Title I, not under Title II, but there has to be differentiation and non discrimination. And clearly, that's not what Tom Wheeler wanted to do, and clearly that's not what the American people wanted. When, when we had a draft of our original NPRM in 2014 leak, which talked about harmful and non-harmful pay prioritization, everybody went just through the roof, right? So if, you, if, if non-discrimination is your focal point, it must be done either under Title II or a clear grant of congressional authorization, okay? Right now, Title II is all we have. And again, we can debate what congressional authorization should look like. I think it should be strong and flexible. I don't think Barron would agree. And it, I mean, strong and flexible for the FCC. Um, you know, if we want to have that conversation, we can have that. But right now, the two sides are like either FCC completely in it or FCC completely out of it. And there's not much room for compromise 
if that's where the sides are right now. Uh, three quick points. Number one, uh, you will hear in this debate that we're talking about uh, Title II light, modernized, tailored Title II, the 21st century. Right? Forbearance is a purely temporary matter. The FCC, like any administrative agency, has the discretion to give and to take. It is, it is an illusion to think that that is a permanent um, whittling down of Title II. And second, on that point, the core of Title II is still in place. The core of Title II is the same core statutory provisions of the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, the, the rules that were designed for railroads. Those still apply. The FCC can essentially do everything under 201B and 202A that, that it could under Title II generally. So this idea that somehow this is just Title II light is an illusion. You have, once you have opened Pandora's box, and here there have been two, 706 and that, you have given the FCC broad discretion. And that, in turn, is what changes investment expectations. That's what drives the, the sort of, of, um, of change that I would commend to you, George Fulton Center did 2010 when neutrality was an assumption from the FCC. Take that as a baseline and you compare that with 20, 2010 to 2015 and he says there's a 20 to 30 percent drop in investment. Go look at his study. These are hard things to measure, but that's I think the only honest way to make this comparison. That's point number one. Point number two, to, to Gigi's point, two and three quick, I'll do okay, quick. I'll try. Uh, number two to Gigi's point, that this entire debate has indeed been about a discrimination. Well, Title II is a discrimination regime. That's what common carriage means. It means you get to charge different prices. You just have to put them in a tariff. So this idea that somehow Title II will allow you to ban paid prioritization is a fundamental misunderstanding of what common carriage regulation is about. And there is another path here where the FCC could very well have said, you know what, we're going to keep the rules on the books and we'll show you how Title II actually works. And we will start allowing broadband providers to charge online service providers for carrying their traffic, which is not, by the way, a fantasy. This is exactly what European uh, operators, in fact, have asked for in a completely different market setting. Uh, and I've forgotten what the third point was, so I'll stop. <laughs> well, oh, well, the third point, really quickly. I'm <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Re re really quickly, go back and reread the Google Verizon framework from 2010. There's always been a middle ground here that, that I, I think Gigi is not acknowledging, which is that you can set a presumption against things like paid prioritization and, and things that do meaningful harm. You can say, you know, you don't even need proof that paid prioritization does cause meaningful harm, but then allow that to be rebutted and, and allow a back and forth based upon real evidence, but set the presumption against it. That's the obvious solution legislatively. And that's what the Janikowski rules had in it. And the DC Circuit said that Title I authority, 706 authority, was not enough. It had to be, it basically gave us, gave us the roadmaps. It's got to be Title II or nothing. Let me, I just got to make a point on the investment. We shouldn't get down in the weeds on the numbers. Free Press has numbers. George Ford has numbers. Hal Singer has numbers. Look at the numbers. It's obviously going to be a very big thing in the proceeding. But I, I want to say two things about that. Number one is no publicly traded ISP has told its investors or the SEC that Title II has had any impact at all on its investment. Okay, so listen to what they say to Wall Street, not necessarily what they say to Capitol Hill. That's number one. Number two, there was a great article today in USA Today, did net neutrality keep broadband out of low-income neighborhoods as FCC claims? There's this great quote by Craig Moffitt, who has always been very favorably disposed to the cable industry, as a cable industry uh, analyst, great guy. He's uh, with Moffitt Nathanson. He says, quote, it's impossible to tell whether the open internet rules have affected investment. There's no way to provide a serious answer that rises above simply trying to reverse engineer the answer you want to find, he said. Okay, I'm just, read the article. Every single analyst in here, and they, and they fund across the board, has said, you really can't map one to the other. Be that as it may, that's going to be a big part of the debate. Can I just make two quick points? So first, um, on on measuring the investment impact of Title II, I think you know that's one of the reasons why we're having a proceeding. Um, I'm sure that there is going to be a lot more economic literature put into the record on this point. Um, frankly, um, the last time around, um, there was some economic literature in the record, uh, but you didn't have one of these things where you know, like in the BDS proceeding. If those of you who have been following the FCC and, and other things, you don't you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it's a very long order. Um, uh, but, the, you know, th there was a ton of economic analysis in that proceeding. I expect that there will be something similar in this proceeding where we'll, we'll be able to see, 
maybe in more robust detail uh, kind of what the investment impact of Title II has been and, and would be going forward. The second part I would just say, the paid prioritization, kind of the history of paid prioritization, um, our read of the D.C. Circuit's decision in Verizon has always been that what, what the court viewed as the FCC's 2010 rule was a flat ban on paid prioritization. That's why they said that it was a common carrier obligation because it left, quote, no room for individualized negotiation. That's why for the first half of the proceeding that was spanning 2014, 2015, um, lots of folks were in the FCC going to meetings trying to help the FCC figure out how you could get to a, re a strong rebuttable presumption against paid prioritization, still satisfy the common carrier prohibition identified in Verizon, but still get at all of the paid prioritization conduct that would be viewed as harmful. Um, something that's come up uh, several times today is the idea of legislation that could codify these rules in some way. And Republicans have said they're not interested right now in doing legislation to get Democrats to the table as well. And there doesn't really seem to be an appetite from put together some kind of deal at the moment. From your guys' perspective, what does a potential Can I just start with an optimistic note really quickly, not answer, but just Nelson today, this morning, said the time will come, we will sit down, and enough people will realize that at this point you can't keep having this herky-jerky policy of the FCC doing one thing and the courts doing another, and it goes back and forth. Just get the thing settled in law. So the thing that I will note that's made particularly challenging the potential for, for legislation that workable across the aisle, I think is, the, is to be quite honest and candid, is, is the approach to this entire proceeding. Um, for someone who came to uh, the chairmanship uh, on something of a platform of transparency and um, who spent the majority of the previous chairman's term criticizing him for a lack of consensus, he has taken a very uh, um, one-sided and extreme approach to addressing this problem, which um, I think is making it very difficult for um, advocates and potentially for for um, for those on the hill to really engage meaningfully because they are starting from such a um, a challenging place and with very little opportunity so far um, to engage in the conversations. That I, that Sarah, so can, can you explain? Very, like, can I finish, please? Um, and so, you know, I think that. There is certainly, this is not ruling out the possibility of a legislative solution, but I, I want to be very clear that the, the people who have advocated for strong net neutrality rules um, will continue to advocate for strong net neutrality rules. And unless there is a viable platform um, in Congress to have a conversation that is uh, not about fake net neutrality, but about real, um, real net neutrality and real authority at the FCC to continue to face, it's going to be very challenging for us to and if I could add, one of the things that we got beat up on when I was at the FCC was, oh, you can't have your made, mind made up, right? <clears throat> this is an open proceeding, you have to look at the record. You know, and we got beat up by Ajit Pai, who personally I like very much. But he's basically gone out and said, this is what I'm going to do, the record be damned. I mean, he hasn't said the record be damned, but that is his posture. And I think, I think the reason he did that was to try to scare Democrats and get them to the table. So I spoke at, a, uh, at Tim's event in, in January where Chairman, pa Chairman Thune got up there uh, and said, you know, when, when the Democrats see what the Republican FCC is gonna do, they're gonna come running to the table, except it's backfired. And I think that the flame was kind of lit in that regard by what happened on privacy. I think that was a strategic mistake, you know, the ISPs blame the Hill, I don't really care. They were really great and important rules, and now they're gone. But the agency could have rolled back those rules slightly in a way that would have made most of the ISPs comfortable. But instead, they went for the nuclear option. So that started things down the wrong path. And, and even moderates like Senator Nelson or Congressman Pallone were like, what the hell? All right, so that started down the, the wrong path. And then you get this NPRM which you know, he, he called it light touch regulation, I call it no touch regulation, because it is leaning heavily, not only into abdicating the FCC's authority, but also having no rules whatsoever, not even Title I rules. So that just is leaving a bad taste in everyone's mouth in an environment that's already 
very partisan and polarized. So I don't think he's done himself, I agree with Sarah, I don't think he's done himself any favors. Were you gonna make a point? Uh, okay. Um, GRA uh, was, was very much uh, counterproductive, and I, I was ambivalent about this at the outset, uh, and I regret that it happened, and I, looking back at this, would have told people that that would be highly counterproductive, precisely because, as Gigi points out, we were already going to resolve this legal question uh, through this rulemaking, which is, again, what this is about. Now, having said that, I, I'm, I'm astonished to hear people say that the, to criticize the way that it is rulemaking. So let's rewind to 2014 when Tom Wheeler rushed out his NPRM to the point where Jessica Rosenworcel uh, said that uh, I, I think that the process has been flawed. I would have preferred a delay. I think we moved too fast to be fair. She joined with the JEET, urging them to take more time on that NPRM. Now contrast that with, with this proceeding, where the FCC chairman, for the first time in the history of the agency, as far as I am aware, published a draft in advance to give people the opportunity to help shape the questions that are asked. And now, all that's going to happen on May 18th is the FCC is going to put out a document asking questions as to the agency's legal authority first and foremost. And when you hear Sarah say that, that this isn't fair, this is slanted against them, we're just we're circling around the same thing that I keep coming back to, which is it's as if they keep skipping the, the, the parts of the, of the authority. That's what this debate has always been about for us. So it's not surprising that the agency would come out and say, Please tell us what you think our legal authority is, and then from that, what we should do. Because that's what this debate's going to be about, and they will have ample opportunity to lay out their views of the agency's legal authority, which is pretty well established on the record. So will we, and it's not a surprise that the agency is very likely going to do what Ajit and Ma always said they thought the law means, and that this is fundamentally a legal question and that arguments about policy will not particularly change that outcome, if at all. And, and one final thing, that the commission itself, in the, the open internet order, and the, and the DC circuit in US Telecom, so lowered the bar on, on how agencies have to justify changes in their opinion, the FCC dismissed reliance interests completely. So it is ironic now that you see some of these same organizations coming back and saying, oh no, you have to have a rich record to justify your changes, and, and where's the, how do you deal with reliance interests? Well, if U.S. Telecom stays on the books, those arguments are irrelevant. He took the words out of my mouth on the transparency point. I think uh, this, this chairman has been remarkably transparent, and there's an obvious way to go in uh, to, you know, to meet with folks, to ask them questions about a draft, ask them questions once the, once the NPRM released. Um, you know, that's, that's a process that we're all still getting used to, but it's a process that's working. Um, and, and in fact, you know, as, as you've seen, I think over the past couple months, you know, the agency has been tweaking uh, based on kind of input that's received based on, uh, you know, the drafts that are, that are released. Another thing I would just add is I, I think it's, th there's just been such a, a, a rush to characterize uh, what the draft, and again, talking about a draft NPRM, what the draft NPRM contains and does and says. First of all, it doesn't do anything, it asks questions. Second of all, it, it asks questions in a very open-ended way. I don't think, and I'm sure somebody will control F and, and check me on this, but I'm not sure there's one tentative conclusion in the whole thing. I mean, the, you know, the FCC often will sort of announce a tentative conclusion and it'll say, we tentatively conclude that blah, 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 and you know, that sort of strongly signals where the FCC is going to going to end up, and it's hard to walk back from that when the FCC does it. That language is is absent, I think, from the NPRM. Again, you can check me, um, but I, I, I think you know there there's been talk on this panel about how the the outcome is is preordained. Um, I think uh, we'll see. Um, in, in the 2014 proceeding, um, it, you know, it was interesting to see kind of how things changed uh, on a dime. Um, as we all know, very quickly, um, abruptly, we were having meetings about one topic um, th the day before it happened and having a meeting on a completely different topic that we didn't think was even in the ballpark the next day. Um, so uh, all, all that is to say, I think, you know, we shouldn't sort of all assume we know um, how this 
crazy story is going to play out because it's certainly been a wild ride so far. Can I just say, it, it's great to hear that there have been changes made to the draft and that there's been engagement along the way. That, I, I, I guess that's easy to say when you're a member of the industry or the Republican Party because that hasn't been the case for, for others. And I think even this week, there was a, an article from, from Politico uh, about the chairman's posturing and building up, I don't know if it was a Republican war chest or an army or what the precise characterization was. But that's not the sort of posturing that, that you would want to put forward if the ultimate goal is to build consensus and um, acceptance around your proposal. Particularly, the proposal is so dramatically different from the existing um, and uh, existing rules. I just need to clarify, I resent the implication that I'm a member of the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be clear, the chairman announced this, this proposal um, at, at a, Repub a private Republican event. Um, it but no, no, Sarah, come on, look, f there is a free market, principled, libertarian, conservative movement that is distinct from the Republican Party. And if you can't acknowledge that, I, I have to take that a little personally. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't intending to lump all Republicans together, and I hope no one... No, but they're not all... That. That's the whole uh, point. They're not all Republicans. Is that the approach that the chairman has used thus far in rolling out this item, um, and, and it, with the acknowledgement that it is a preliminary item, uh, the draft from Chairman Wheeler changed dramatically um, in, in the, the time from when it was put forward in, 2014, in March of May of 2014 and when it was ultimately adopted. Um, but, but the, the way that this is, my point was merely that the way that this has been ruled out does not suggest a willingness to come to a consensus-based position, but rather a, um, a specific position that seems Legal questions are not amenable to consensus-based decision-making. The job of Congress is to reach consensus. The job of the agency, first and foremost, is to determine what the law means. Well, except that this chairman Ever since he walked in the door, talked about consensus building, how Wheeler just did whatever he wanted. Trust me, I mean, I still have like the dents upside my head. <laughs> you know, he did his own press conference more than any other minority commissioner, spent his time beating up on the chairman and his, you know, I gave him all these changes and he didn't take any of them. And so he has, he has cut his teeth on some sort of consensus builder. And I praise his transparency. I wish that my boss had been a little bit more transparent. I've said, I'm not sure putting out the whole item, but if it's working, fine. I don't have a problem with him. I praise him for that. But let's not, let's not fog what we think about the substance, which is bad, and I disagree. Look, if he's not saying he's tentatively concludes he's reclassifying in that item, I don't know what the hell he's saying. If he didn't say conclusion, so what? I mean, he said it in speech. He's probably saying it right now at the, you know, at AEI. Okay, he wants to reclassify. Where it was a little shakier, although I think it was heavily leaning. You can lean without saying tentative conclusion. Do we need these rules at all, right? And you know, there were all those rumors about, you know, ISPs making promises and forced by the, you know, by the FTC. To me, if you whole package and everything he's been saying since the day he became chair does not think the FCC should have oversight authority over broadband, that the FTC is an adequate police person or police agency to do that. And that's where we fundamentally disagree. And if that's the way that Congress is going to go, they're not going to get any buy-in from our groups or the Democrats, for that matter. Gigi's framing puts this debate into stark relief. She said policy questions. Those are questions that you resolve after you determine whether you have legal authority, not before. And, I, and my point to you again today is please do us at least the courtesy of acknowledging that these are, these are distinct questions and that we have views about the legal authority here for, for very good reasons, for the same reasons that EFF back in 2008 to 2010 referred to the FCC's original theory of Six and about Title II. And, and then EFF came to its senses. When the person <laughs> left who had been responsible for that work and the organization changed, and I think that is deeply unfortunate that there has been a lack of skepticism 
about the unintended consequences of invoking legal authority. I just leave you with, you know, the great Chekhov line about the, the, his, his advice for writing uh, uh, theater, drama. If you show a gun in act one, it must be used before the end of the play, right? <laughs> this is the way to, to understand claims of legal authority, right? Once you invoke something, you can say you're forbearing and you're doing a light version of it, but it is only a matter of time before that legal authority is used in ways that you yourself may deeply regret. And I would commend Gigi in this respect because it was public knowledge. And I think Gigi personally, who fought one of the most important battles, I believe back in 2004, 2005, over the FCC copyright policing into its authority. Where we, if we had been having this debate back then, we would have seen basically exactly a flip-flop where Republicans were, were making the mistake of saying, well, there's a problem. We've got to do something about it. There's no other adequate remedy, and therefore we must have legal authority. And Gigi, to her credit, stood up and said, no, you do not have legal authority. That is the question to be answered first and foremost, and then we can have a policy debate. I have a final question. Uh, I am curious to hear what to happen so that we're not sitting here in the same to eight years from now having the same debate. What needs to take place? I mean, I think what needs to happen, and I say this with a tremendous amount of optimism as someone who listened to, going back to the, the original proposal from Chairman Wheeler in 2014, which did not include, which was not, uh, it, it included Title II, but it was, uh, it leaned more towards a 706 approach. And there were a lot of people, there were a lot of debates and panels like this that said, hey guys, like, you just need to, to move this forward. Um, th this proposal sounds okay. And we said, no, we need strong, enforceable rules grounded in clear legal And, you know, a tremendous amount of groups, um, DC advocates, <coughs> grassroots and net groups, groups across the country, um, groups representing communities of color, companies <laughs> large and small, um, got together and said, we're gonna, we're gonna fight this fight and we're gonna fight it till, till the very end. And that same constituency is still, still motivated. And so what I say, say to you all is what's next? How do we avoid fighting this? We have to be impassioned. We can't be afraid to, uh, to wade through the murky questions and come out with, with the right response. And I, and I think um, we will see a reinvigoration of energy into this conversation. The clear will of the people that we saw in 2014 is heard once again. Um, so you said strong, enforceable, open to net rules, grounded in, in uh, lasting legal authority. I, I would, I mean, emphasize the sort of durable or lasting aspect of that legal authority. Clearly, you know, we're going to be flip flopping back and forth as administrations change over this legal authority debate. Um, Uh, legislation. So I, I don't know if there's any representatives of ISPs in the room other than Matt, <laughs> but let me remind you that every single time the ISPs have sued the FCC or promoted the CRA, it has not worked out well for you. Okay? So Kevin Martin didn't even have rules. Okay? He had a policy statement. Tried to enforce him. I, mean, I remember the room, it was in August of what, 2008 or something like that, or 2007, and it was like filled with public interest advocates and cheering. And Comcast decided, and Comcast, so, so they enforced the, the policy statement against Comcast. They didn't even punish Comcast, they didn't even fi fine him. And Comcast decided to stand on principle and they're going to court. Okay, they went to court, they won. Janikowski starts a proceeding, okay to adopt rules. They, they weren't particularly strong rules, in my opinion. I remember being on the phone with Janikowski and begging him to apply them to wireless, and he wouldn't do it. He and I don't even speak anymore. We used to be friends, OK? I mean, that's, that's how bad this Over whole debate has been. Uh, well, that and other <laughs> things, trust me. Um, so we have these relatively weak rules grounded in Title I, and Verizon's like, you know, my friend Helgi Walker, I love her to death, we're going to court. How did that turn out for them, right? It turned out into Title II. Same thing with the CRA. The ISPs, you know, push for the CRA. Again, there's some debate over who was pushing for it. CRA succeeds. What happens? Fifteen states introduce bills with their own privacy rules. So I guess I want to put a word of caution here. 
We could just, as Sarah said, we could just leave it be right now, okay, and have these rules which are not goring anybody's ox. They're wildly popular with the American people. But just be cautious. If you push this forward, it could land up being worse for you. So I think you have to decide, do you really, really want that debate? Like I said, I will talk to anybody about legislation, but it cannot include uh, making the FCC toothless. That just cannot be the case. If a Republican FCC decides not to use that authority, you know, Pike could have decided I'm not going to enforce net neutrality. That's one of the first things he did right out of the box, right? He said, no, I'm, I'm closing all the zero rating investigations, not interested, who doesn't love free data, blah, 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 blah. He could have chosen to do that. But abdicating the authority, that's a different story. And that's something that I just don't see our groups, the American people, frankly, they don't really trust Comcast, at t and Charter and Verizon to protect their interests. Has, and has anybody seen the reaction to Comcast's tweets and Comcast policy posts? They're not kind. And it's not just from Democrats, trust me. Okay, there's a lot of and the left that these companies have become too powerful and don't have their customers' best interests in mind. Which is why we have law enforcement agencies. So no one in this debate is arguing that there shouldn't be a cop on the beat. I have made clear repeatedly, I think the better approach here is the Federal Trade Commission for basically the reasons that Carter-era Democrats like Alfred Kahn believe, that we are better off dealing with consumer protection and competition issues through laws of general applicability that are developed by agencies that have to deal with a wide range of industries and that we deal with concerns about their lack of expertise by building up that expertise. We can transfer staff to the FTC. We can empower that agency to be the regulator here. That's my best case scenario. I realize that legislation is all about the art of the possible, and we may very well wind up in a situation where the FCC retains jurisdiction, and if it's going to, it should be to enforce clear rules and a, re and a reasonable standard, or for, for the things that are not covered a reasonable standard, to be left to the Federal Trade Commission. And that is not a crazy right-wing idea. That is the implication of the Waxman Bill from 2010, the Google Verizon framework, and the current bill that has been on offer for two years from, from Republicans. So go read those documents for yourself. Study the history of the bills here, and I think you'll see that there is the possibility of a legislative compromise. But as I say, I fear that won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, the only way to avoid this game of ping pong is for the court finally to resolve these questions. And if you think that seems unlikely now, I will just leave you with the thought that you cannot find a better predictor, a better barometer, of where the Supreme Court is going on administrative law and fundamental constitutional questions than Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit. He has, in several cases, in dissents, has led the way for the Supreme Court to start drawing major lines around how administrative agencies operate, most notably in the UR decision, which is one of the cases that we think there is a reasonably good chance there is an NPRM out there making the court less likely to grant cert just as a matter of managing its docket. I, I hold out hope the court may finally resolve this, and that that indeed may be the only way to get Congress finally to legislate here. Thank you so much for being with us, having this very lively discussion about this topic. Great stuff. I, I move this so it wouldn't be in the shot. Oh, thank you.